Good evening. Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Virtual Events. My name is Elizabeth and I am the events coordinator at Gibson's Bookstore. We are joined this evening by two sports writers. We are joined by Ian Thompson, who is in conversation with our star of the evening, Lee Montville, who is the author of Tall Men, Short Shorts, the 1969 NBA Finals, Wilt, Russ, Lakers, Celtics, and a very young sports writer. This book is available from Gibson's Bookstore, and Lee very graciously sent in signed book plates for us for any of these copies that you order from Gibson's. And then Ian, as well, has a sports book. It's been out for a little while, um, but it is also a basketball book. It is, uh, let's see, let's find it. Where is it here? The Soul of Basketball, the epic showdown between LeBron, Kobe, Doc, and Dirk that saved the NBA. So they've got a lot of bouncing balls to talk about tonight. Thank you to the two of you for joining me this evening. It's good, July, it's good, July, the middle of basketball season. Yeah, yes. yeah the so, traditional time of year. So the two of you know each other, so you guys are going to have a great conversation. Right over to the two of you. Well, Lee, I have to say, I've been waiting a long time for you to write a book like this. I've known you since the 1980s when I first came to the Boston Globe straight out of college. Jackie McMullen and I were hired the same year straight out of college. Um, and hearing your stories over the years, just as your friend, I've always wanted you to write a memoir. And I'm, I'm so glad that you've done this because the book's just beautiful. Um, Tell, tell me, can you tell me why why you wanted to do this at this stage? Um, I I'd say no comment. Um, I, I don't, this is this is oh, gonna go great. This okay. is gonna be a great great yeah, time. No 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 no. Um, it's kind of a sneaky memoir. Um, I I've always had a thought of of doing a memoir, and and when when you get to be a hundred years old, you you start to tell stories that other people look at you and you, you, you know, you're telling a story and you say, and then George Washington put in his false teeth and they were made of wood. And uh, it, the things that you kind of knew when way back when seemed new and different and historic to people. Um, and, and so you, you kind of want to record your stories a little bit before you go away. Uh, I, I had a moment that, this is probably too much to explain, but I had a moment. I, I, I was waiting for a doctor's appointment in downtown Boston, and, and it was across the street from Suffolk University. And I looked at Suffolk University, and I remember the guy, Lou Connolly, who used to be the PR guy at Suffolk University. And he, he was kind of an energetic guy, and a, a good guy, but a little energetic and over the top. So. We, we moved to the Super Bowl broadcast of whatever year it was when the Miami Dolphins were going, were going for their, their, uh, their unbeaten season. And, and a guy, Will McDonough, who worked at the Globe with me, told me this story that Kurt Gowdy, who was the broadcaster for the, that Super Bowl game, it was about three minutes before the game was going to begin. And Kurt was like on pins and needles, nervous about the whole deal. And a phone rang and they said, Kurt, it's for you. And Kurt was thinking somebody in the family had died, something big had happened. But no, he picked up the phone and it was Lou Connolly. And he said, Kurt, I hope you have a good broadcast. Could you mention somewhere in there that Nick Bonacani, the middle linebacker for the, the Miami Dolphins, is, is a graduate of Suffolk Law School? And, <laughs> Kurt kind of threw down the, the phone <laughs> and, you know, and it was like a, a monumental case of Hutzman and, and a great story. But what I realized was that Will McDonough, who told me the story, he was dead. Lou Connolly was dead. Uh, Nick Bonacani was dead. And uh, everybody was dead. And does this story kind of exist anymore if, if, if I'm dead, you know? Um, and so, that was kind of a realization that if you want to get these stories out, you better get them out. And so I, I, I was able to frame it with this narrative, which is 
a, a good story in itself of the seven games between the, the Celtics and the Lakers um, and, and very much a time warp uh, from, from then till now. And I was able to slip in my, my little stories, you know, that, that it, and I have a whole bunch of other ones, but, but these were kind of basketball related and, and, and I slipped them in along the way, kind of like breadcrumbs on the way to, uh, you know, see grandma. I'm really glad you're not dead. Yeah, I'm glad that too, you know, it's, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. well, you, you know, it, it, it could be a posthumous Zoom thing, you know, talking about the book. I mean, it's a glass. You would have, you would have to carry the ball. It's a glass half full way of looking at it. I'm not yes. dead. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're glad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, did you, when you look back on it, uh, obviously that, that, finals and the subject of your book, it revolves around that 1969 NBA finals, Bill Russell's final year against the Lakers. Um, and it's still worth talking about. I mean, it's, it's got to be one of the two or three biggest series in the history of NBA basketball. Um, but when you look back on it, do you think you were self-aware at that time of what you were seeing that this was one of these monumental kind of showdowns that this was the kind of thing that was going to last. Know, I, I was new to the whole thing. Uh, uh, I, I, had, I had never been to California. I'd never seen a palm tree. I'd never seen the Pacific Ocean. Um, I'd never been on a plane where they showed a movie. I, you know, it was a whole bunch of first things. So yeah, it was monumental to me. Um, why? Why I think it's interesting now is that it's, it's kind of an underreported thing because there wasn't a lot of video that came out of that. And the video that, that came out of it looks old. Like, like you see video of Babe Ruth and you think he's that fat old guy kind of chugging around the bases, you know? But he wasn't. Babe Ruth was, was, was a specimen of a guy when he was a young ball player. But that's the, the image you have. And so the image you have of, of that series is kind of dated by, 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 by the technology that, that's around it. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, to me, it, it was like going through Wonderland, going back and forth across, across America and, and, uh, and, you know, drinking free Pepsi Cola and smoking cigarettes and having a wonderful time, you know, except, except kind of the last two times going back again. Yeah. Um, it, it was like, wow, these guys get pretty tired out just doing this traveling. I'm tired doing the traveling, you know, and I'm not playing the games. Yeah. Are there moments where it feels like it was just yesterday? Well, sure. You know, um, especially when you do a book and you kind of kind of bring it all back. I mean, it, and part of this book is I, I went back and I, I uh, you know, looked up all my stories that I had written and I looked up everybody else's stories you know, through, through the magic of the computer. And you, you're kind of living in that time and you're living with all your contemporaries of that time, which are all these guys who are now dead. You know, the, 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 whole, layer, the whole layer of people in front of me, you know, yeah. the, the, um, the sports writers that, that, that had been established there, um, they, they're all gone. My bosses are gone um, and it, it's kind of nice bringing them up, bringing them back and being, reading their stories and that they're, they're alive. And I, I was so young and I, I was like, I think everybody when they're young, you, you're kind of, you have a mixture of self-confidence and, and, and fear, I suppose. And, uh, and, and you think, let's get it going. You say, let's clear out the deadwood. You know, I'm, I'm the future. I, I know. I, I know this, there was a thing then called new journalism where, where you kind of tried to write like you're writing a, a, a fiction book, but nonfiction and have facts and stuff. And these old guys didn't do that. And you were saying to yourself, well, get them out of the way. They're just doing the, you know, the old game stories and, and they got to get some, you know, some, some, uh, I don't know, some observations in there that, uh, that they're not getting. And, and, and you're wrong, of course, because you, you're the young guy and, and you, you, you go through the years and all of a sudden you realize you're the deadwood, you know? You, you say, 
everybody's doing it on their on their on their iPhone, you know, Twitter and, and, and sending these little messages out. What the hell is that all about? And you're the dead one. When you look back on your when you were going back and reading your old stories from that time. Did you remember most of them or was it almost like reading somebody else because you'd written thousands of stories since then? Yeah, in a way it was like reading some somebody else and, and you, you kind of embarrass yourself a little bit there here and there and you, you say I could have done this better and I could have done that better and uh, uh, it got down, it got down to the climactic seventh game and 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 I, I, I realized there were. I thought there were a bunch of things I could have done better. Um, but you, it, it, it's cra It's a crazy business where your 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 head is just spinning, and you have to go to two locker rooms, and 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 you're talking to one guy, and over on the other side, everybody is laughing at something somebody said on the other side, and you say, "Oh my God, I got to go over to the other side." So you go over there and then everybody's laughing at the last guy you left, you know, you're, yeah. you're you, you never seem to be in the right place, it seems to me. And, and you live in terror because of that. Yeah. I mean, you and I both can, uh, we both experienced the end of an era in the sense of if you write today for a website, there is no deadline, really. I mean, you can you don't have to get a story in so it can be edited and printed and put on the trucks and delivered to the homes by 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. You just don't have to worry about that today. But, but the deadline is now. I Ex mean, that, well, that's your that, deadline. Your deadline is now, you know, you, 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 you want to kind of transmit it from your head without touching the keys at all from your head to the, to wherever you're supposed to send it to, you know, it's a, uh, it's an instantaneous business, whereas the other was, was, was a more reflective business, which I think we were both kind of reflective kind of writers where, where, where we'd like to look at things and kind of arrange them right and, and, and write a nice story. But it's, it's tough to do that now, I think. You know, there, there are a few outlets that will let you do it, but not a lot. I mean, most, most outlets, they, they want you to just pound out the, the latest thought that you, that you had in your head. And you go to press boxes now, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this, that, that it's quiet. It's like being in an insurance office, you know, and nobody's talking, nobody's telling stories to each other. Nobody's telling jokes because if you have a joke, why would you tell it to the next guy? Because you can type it out on, on, on your Twitter feed right now and send it to the world, you know? Um, it's there's a lack of human interaction, I think, in the whole process now. I mean, even watching games, I remember sitting with you at Celtics playoff games in the 1980s, and we would have those great seats with the Globe sitting courtside at the Boston Garden when they're playing the Lakers. And every time something would happen in the game, we and everybody else on the press row would take specific notes about what had happened. You'd record every single basket that was, was scored. Today, I, I just see a lot of people on, who are on Twitter, on social media during the games, and there just isn't as much watching the game itself. You go to the game, but you're not watching the game until it's one of the big moments of the game. It's a real, it's a real difference. And I, I sense also the fans are maybe less interested in watching the games. They more, there's more interest in trade rumors and all that kind of thing. But when you were at that finals in 69, you, you, it's clear from reading the book that you were really into every game and every moment of the game. Well, yeah, well, I mean, those, that, that series, I mean, television was not the biggest thing in the world then. Um, yeah. In that series, two of the seven games were on television in Boston and mm. three of the seven games were on television in, in, uh, in, in, in Los Angeles. There, there was a whole thing about, um, about the blackout, you blacked out when home games were played. You blacked out television so that you made sure that you you would get a, a, a better attendance, you know. And uh, that that was so a, a thing that went through the whole NBA. 
and the Celtics, in addition, their TV broadcast was uh, channel 38 for the playoffs. And they didn't want to spend the money to send someone out for the first two games in Los Angeles, and which, which was unbelievable. So it, it was all Johnny Most on the radio and, uh, and, and, and myself, you know, I mean, the, the few sports writers that, the, that their newspapers spent, spent the money to send them out there, we were telling you the story in the morning. And, uh, and I was for the evening globe, which gave me a bit more time. You know, I, I, I could work till, till four and five in the morning, you know, if I wanted, because it wasn't going to be in till the afternoon. And there are no afternoon papers anymore. And, and yeah. it, it, it was a, a different situation um, and kind of interesting. You know, that's, that's why the broadcasters were so big at that time. Johnny Most, everyone, everyone in Boston could do a Johnny Most impression. And, and uh, Chick Hearn in, in Los Angeles, uh, same thing. You know, Johnny had the gravel voice and Chick was a very staccato sounding guy. And he invented a lot of a lot of terms that are used today in basketball. Um, and I, I did the audio book for this, which was just kind of an upset there. And, and uh, that's the one I say that they're sending the audio book to Guantanamo Bay to get the terrorists to talk. You know, to, we'll play it 24 hours a day. Uh, but but that shouldn't stop you from buying it. Uh, did you do a John? Did you do a John Boehner well, when you were doing the audio book? Well, that, that, that's Please the thing. That's the thing. You know, you you got to. You, 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 I was reading and, and I quoted Johnny Most and some things, and and I was all by myself in this little closet with a microphone, and who cares? And so I started talking like Johnny. Johnny, Johnny Most, you know, I am on first side, you know. Did you? Everybody did that, and then Chick Hearn. I started talking real fast like Chick Hearn, and you know. <laughs> The popcorn machine and the thing and, and and you know god knows how that plays in in all of america or guantanamo bay it's probably what makes them will make them talk i don't know that's great so i mean i've i've been covering basketball i mean i'm, I'm glad i'm not dead either because i've been doing this a while <laughs> i'm glad you're not dead also Ian. Oh, thank you that's very kind of you i don't get that a lot so thanks <laughs> um but uh this idea of who Bill Russell really was and what what the game was like back then. And again, that's that's one of the great series of all time. And yet I realized while reading the book, I I knew very little about it. And I should know something about it with with all the work I've done. And I was just really grateful to really get a sense of who Bill Russell was in that moment. And then you had the uh, you had uh, the special luck of working with Bill Russell. If you could tell people about that a little bit, you you were sort of partners with him in the journalistic enterprise during that series. I don't know how much luck it was. Um, you know, I was twenty five. Bill Russell was thirty five. I had never been to California. I'd never seen a palm tree. Never seen the Pacific Ocean. Bill Russell had seen the world. You know, he'd been to Africa. He'd been to, he'd won he'd won ten world championships. You know, he. He'd seen everything, and and he was kind of a I don't know if the word aloof is the right thing or reserved or he, but he, he really didn't have time for a 25 year old guy who, who's just bopping up with with like extra questions. I mean he he was the coach and the star of the team, which is an unbelievable thing when you think about it now. Um, that that he was a player coach. And how many assistants did he have? He had no assistants. You know, he was all by himself. So he was the coach. He was the star player. And then he added on this thing where he, he was doing a column for the Boston Globe during the playoffs. I, I kind of set that up for him. I, they, different papers had different players, you know, um, speaking. And, and it was kind of like inside knowledge that that you would get into your thing. It was kind of stupid. It was like the interviews that you would get as, as the players leave the field now at halftime and, and it's kind of just mumbled, you know, yeah, we got to play better in the second half of the game. And, and that, that was the content of most of those stories. But, but Red Arbach had done one paper and, and John Havlicek had done another. And so I said to my boss, Ernie Roberts, we should have someone. And he said, well, everybody's taken up. And I said, 
well, we should have Bill Russell, you know? And he said, do you think Bill Russell would do that? And I said, well, we can ask him. And, and it was like short money. It was like 200 bucks a column. And I mean, short money was like, I was getting about 200 bucks a week, but, but it was 200 bucks a column. And I went to him and, and, and we had this distant relationship. And I said, Bill, the Boston Globe would like you to know. And he said, uh, well, how much would it pay? And I said, 200 bucks. And he said, I could do that. And, and that was all that was involved. There were no contracts, there were no agents. It was like, I'll take the 200 bucks a game and add it to my little, uh, my, my little kick that I'm getting out of it. And, uh, and the, the hard part was that my job for every game was that at the end of the game, and, and just before Bill would be leave the locker room, I would have to say to him, uh, Bill, um, don't forget to, to call the Boston Globe. He would call the Globe and give his opinions over, over a, a, a blue plastic record in a dictaphone machine. And, and some kid from Northeastern would type it up and maybe get the names right, and maybe not get the names right. And the thing would go into the paper. And so I, I would have to say, uh, Bill, <laughs> you know, could, could you call, make sure you call the Globe? And, and he did, he only missed one day in the, the whole, and this was the, 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 the two playoff series before, before the final series. He, he, he was very good on that. Right. So I've always wondered, I've always had the feeling that if Bill Russell played today, he, he would be a star. But I didn't see him play in person. What, how do you think he would play in today's, today's NBA? You know, it, it's kind of a different game. I mean, there, there was more driving to the basket then. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, there was more chances to, to, to block shots from guys coming in. I think he would still be very good because he could leap out of the building and he had great reflexes and he had a great basketball mind. He, 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 he invented the block shot, basically. Uh, you and I have talked about that once, that, that he invented the block shot. He, he, he was at the University of San Francisco and he was a sophomore and, and he was in the, in the game early in the season. And, and there was a guy from Cal Berkeley who was supposed to be the all-America center. And, and the guy came and went for a layup and Russell jumped in the air and blocked it away. And then he did it again. And then he did it again. He blocked like five shots. And, and the coach of San Francisco called timeout. And he, he said, what do you think you're doing? And Russell said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping him from scoring the basket. And he said, that's not the way you play defense. You, you anchor your feet. You don't jump. When the, when the guy jumps, you anchor your feet and, and, and just react on, on the ground because he has to come down. And Russell said he went out and tried it. And that didn't work so well. And he said, the hell with this. I, and and he went back and was blocking shots. And pretty soon everybody was blocking shots. Uh, uh, that, I mean, that, that's a story that I came across in, in the middle of doing the book. I, I, I had kind of not realized it. And they never say that. Nobody says Bill Russell invented blocking shots. Yeah. But he did. Yeah. Yeah, no, the one time I, I spent time with Bill Russell, he said, you do know I invented the block shot. Yeah, I said I always figured he did, but and then he told me that story. <laughs> yeah, I thought God invented the block shot. I don't know, you know. I mean, you know, but you know that now they'll they'll tell you that uh, Antikupo invented the block shot just last Thursday. All I know is Al Gore invented the internet, and we're all <laughs> because of him. Hey, uh, um, which, which well, is which is why we're able to talk right now. <laughs> what what was it like to see Russell? play against Chamberlain to be to be fighting against each other for position for rebounds leadership of their teams Chamberlain was just such an overpowering force you know he I, at the end of the book I I say which I think is the the most true statement in the whole book that no one in the in the 50 x years since since Will Chamberlain left no one has said no said about a player this is another Wilt Chamberlain who's come along. He's yeah. never been compared to anybody. Yeah. Shaquille O'Neal a little bit, but, but he was different from Shaquille O'Neal. He, he had far more coordination than Shaquille O'Neal. He could go outside and shoot. 
he could do just anything. And he was just a physical for force in nature. And Russell was kind of like, you know, the Dutch boy at the dike putting his fingers in the holes and was just holding off this guy and was very good at holding on, holding him off and very good at getting into his head. Um, if, if Chamberlain had a head to match his body, if Chamberlain had Russell's head and Russell, or Russell had Chamberlain's body, they, they would have been the ultimate players, you know? Yeah. Um, they were just, that was, that was the beauty of the thing that, that it was stopping this big overpowering glute that could do anything he wanted. He, he seemed to have, Wilt seemed to go like, he, he didn't like to be coached. I don't think any coach who, who tried to coach him ever came away with, with, with half of their, their brain cells still intact, you know? He didn't want to practice. He, and when he did practice, he disturbed practice. He was a tough guy that way. Whereas Russell was the ultimate planner and, and had everything planned out. And Wilt was far more reactive. It was like, like Wilt had that cartoon light bulb above his head, you know? And the light bulb would go on and, and say, he'd say, I think I should score some points. And he scores a hundred points in Hershey, Pennsylvania. You know, he, he scored 60 points a bunch of times. And then some other time he'd say, I think tonight I should get rebounds. And oh. he, would, he got 55 rebounds. That's still the NBA record. And he would get a bunch of rebounds. Or another time he said, I, I think I'd like to get assists. And he led the league in assists for an entire year. He, yeah. he, he just, he just, kind of partitioned himself off and it was very strange that way I think you know that that, that he would that, that he would come in and sometimes he would disappear and other times he would overpower everything yeah yeah the year before the year before 1968 the finals the Celtics played the Lakers also the Celtics played the, the Philadelphia 76ers before they played the Lakers and everyone thought the Philadelphia 76ers were going to win and they were up three to one, you know, and they had Wilt and what a wonderful thing. And the Celtics won, won the next game and they won the next game and they got to the big seventh game and it got to the final, the final period and Wilt scored four points, you know, yeah. that, that was, that helped to hasten his, his departure to Los Angeles. He was, yeah. he, he was just hard to figure out. So for me, I mean, people talk a lot about Michael Jordan or LeBron James, but the most intriguing player in the history of basketball to me is Bill Russell. I'm, I'm so glad to be able to talk to you about him here because here's a guy, you think about his last two years at San, University of San Francisco where he won 55, his last 55 games, I think, something like that. Two NCAA titles. He goes to the Olympics in Rome, wins that, as a leader of that team, comes to the Celtics, wins 11 of the 13 championships that, he, that are available to him. So he's done all of that in the space of four, what, 15 years. On top of it, he's, uh, he's a leader in the civil rights battle. Uh, he's the first black guy to become a head coach in the major professional sports. He's carrying that responsibility. Uh, you look at his record in seventh games. So when they were, when the pressure was the greatest, he just gave everything he had to make sure they won all those games. In the book, you talk about him being exhausted, but did, could you really see that? Could you see a guy that had just, he was just running out of steam and this, this was the last that he no, had to get No, he had, a, he had arthritis in his knees and, and, and like late in the season, he had just collapsed playing a game against the Knicks, running up and banging against a young Willis Reed. And mm -hmm. he had just collapsed and he, he was out for, for five games um, because he, he was just beat up. And Tom Sanders once said, he, he would say, I can give you three minutes, you know, where I can hold Wilt down for three minutes, but you guys have to score some baskets while, while I'm holding them down. <laughs> and he could just peel off parts of himself and, and, and respond to when, when he had to do it. I mean, he, he had some bad games in the, in, in, in this series. He had, he had a terrible game in, 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 in the fifth game 
you know, and Wilt just pummeled them. And you, you went away from the fifth game and said, well, you know, how, how will they survive? And, and they won the sixth game. And then the seventh game, he, he was the guy, you know, he, he, he was still there and, and he, he made everybody else better. I mean, that's an old cliche in sports, but he was the guy that made everybody better. And, and, and that's what Orbach, Red Orbach saw in him, that he was a guy, Red Orbach loved to run. He loved it, running, running, running. I mean, when you covered the Celtics, when I covered the Celtics, it, when anybody covered the Celtics, if they won the game, they, they, they would say, well, we were running pretty good tonight. John Havlicek would always say, we were running pretty good. And when they lost the game, they would always say, we weren't running very good tonight. And it, 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 it's, it's like, I don't know, we, we were sweating very good and we weren't sweating very good, but that was, that was the, the hallmark of the Celtics. And he was the perfect guy for a team that wanted to run because when he would get the rebound, he would fling it out and, and guys would be on, the, on, on flying. Whereas Chamberlain, on the other hand, he, he and Butch von Bredikoff, the Lakers coach, were at odds kind of right from the beginning. And, and von Bredikoff started calling him the load. And that was his nickname, the load. And the Lakers couldn't get out and run. So the Lakers were losing because they weren't running, you know? And, so, yeah. and, and Van Bredikoff kept on saying it, the load. Hmm. But what, what was it like to be around Russell? You know, after a practice, when he's talking as the coach or after a game, and it, you have this impression of a guy that was very intimidating and aloof was a used, term used. But I imagine he could be very charming too in, in those kinds of situations. What, what was that like just to be around him, just chatting in a group, obviously? Well, the problem was sometimes there was nobody else around. I mean, back then you would cover the Celtics and you'd go to practice sometimes and you'd be the only person, you know, you'd, you'd cover the, 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 the they went in a met, they, they practiced in a metropolitan gym in, in Roxbury, you know, and, and sometimes nobody would be there outside of you. And that would be intimidating for me, just Bill and I, because probably because I would say something and he'd kind of, and that was it. But every once in a while, he, he would become more expansive. And when other guys were around, like, like the New York sports writers who'd been around for his whole career and, and, and the famous sports writers, Bud Collins who, here in Boston and the guys from Sports Illustrated, Frank DeFord, they, they would be, he would, he would let himself out. And so I, I would be the fly on the wall when, when they were talking. Um, but man to man, it was for, for me, for young man to old man, it, it, it was kind of tough. He, uh, that there would be every once in a while, you know, it would wind up, it would be just me and him, you know, and, and, and I might think of some question that would pique his interest and, and he would talk and, and we would talk for, for 10, 15 minutes, you know, and, and I, would, I would leave and I'd say, Bill Russell and I are very close now. And then the next day I'd, I'd walk, to practice and I'd say hello Bill and he would walk right by me like I didn't exist so I I can understand that you know he yeah. he didn't need the grief of, of some guy that had never seen the Pacific Ocean asking him questions and it wasn't that sure of basketball you know I mean my basketball knowledge was just as a fan you know do you think he knew your name uh, I don't know it, it, I don't know. Um, I, you're twenty. You're twenty five, right? I'm twenty five. I, yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I have, I have a weird spelling name, L E I G H. You know, yeah. but did he call me Lehigh? Did he? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I really don't know if he knew who I was. He, he, I bet he knew me as like, like the redheaded guy with the squeaky voice who comes and, and is a real pain in the ass. You know. I don't do, you think know. He, do you think he read the stories, in the paper? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I would bet not. I would, he, maybe he read his own stories, you know? Maybe, <laughs> maybe he said, you know, the, the, the editors got to me or something, but they didn't edit them at all, really. Um, saying I need to use more modifiers when I yeah, do. I, I don't think he read the stories at all. I, I think 
I think if there was some story that came along that 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 would upset him, somebody would bring it to him and, and say, yeah. Bill, what about this, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I would bet he didn't read the stories. And what about years over the years after, if maybe you would run into him when he was coaching elsewhere or some events, would, did he ever show a sign that he remembered you? Not so much. I, I did a story on him uh, when he, he was a coach in, in uh, Sacramento and they had me do a story on him and I kind of mumbled, you know, it, it, there was, a, there was a, a lot of recidivism in my head, I think, when I went, you know, I, I was like, oh God, I got to go see Bill Russell now. And uh, yeah, I mean, he was pleasant and we talked, but but it wasn't like, you know, I remember those days and what a time it was. It was kind of grumbling. I, I, I might have written a couple of columns af after he left about, about my relationship with him and how he was a tough guy. He was a tough guy for a lot of people in yeah. Boston. And he, he, he would always talk about Boston in, in totally negative terms, you know, about how racist it was and, and, and all of that. And all of that is true. But but the, there was a lot of love for him too. I mean, he got standing ovations. He got carried off the court. Uh, there, there were people. There were people who wanted to to do nice things for Bill Russell. Um, and and the other guys, uh, African American guys like Casey Jones and and Sam, Tom Sanders, Sam Jones. I mean, Casey and Tom Sanders. They 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 lived here after they retired. You know, for a long time. Um, they, there was some love to be had it, along with the annoyance, but, but he didn't see that part. Mm. So this, this, you've written a lot of books, written a lot of kinds of stories, feature stories, columnists, you were a star writer at Sports Illustrated for years, and then you've written books on a variety of subjects. Was, was this a different kind of muscle? that you were flexing to write this one because it was so personal and you were going well, back yeah, to memories. Including myself and and I call myself the bright young man, you know, and and I just started typing and the first chapter was about me being 25 years old and, and excited and going off to the, the playoffs and, and and so I called myself the bright young man and, and kind of went through the bright young man all the way, all the way. And, and I said, well, what do I new, do now, you know? Do I change it to I or he, or can I say he, or is he still the bright young man? And I, I said, well, he's still the bright young man. I, and I carried that through the whole book. And yeah. I, I didn't want to keep saying the bright young man because you, you'd get sick of that with, with all these. So I, I, I made an acronym, TBYM. And I, I don't know, I, I think it worked okay. I mean, nobody has come to me and said, that really bugged me that you call yourself by that acronym, you know, like ABC, NBC or something, you know? Um, but it, 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 I think it kind of worked in, in, in being able to tell the stories from my present perspective, looking back at the bright young man, you know? Yeah. I mean, not the bright young man now. Yeah, you know what? Knowing you as well as I do, I think you would have had a hard time writing a book where you just began every sentence with I. I did this, I did that. Am I right? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, our, everybody in our business is kind of shied away from the, the, the first person pronoun, I think. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there were a few guys that, that, that would do it all the time, I think, and I this and I that. And we would all talk about them, you know? Who cares what they think? Uh, but I, yeah, I, I think it would have been hard to do it with the eye. It, and let me ask you this while I have you, because I, this is a question I get all the time. People ask, who would win? The, the 86 Celtics against the Steph Curry Warriors. If, if you were, to, if, if the, if the best Celtics team of the 60s played, I don't know, the LeBron's Lakers or, or Steph Curry's Warriors, a team of today, how do you think that game would go? 
Well, I mean, the team of today, um, well, they couldn't beat Nigeria. That would be one thing. <laughs> uh, the team of today, uh, the, the, the team of today would, would have such a better physical conditioning and, and be in much better shape and, and be able to jump higher and, and run faster. But I mean, if the team, the teams back then had, had, had gone through the same kind of development, you know, the same players, you, you know, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's a real hard sport to do that with. Um, I, I remember seeing a Sports Illustrated story once about who, who would be able to play today, who played then. This was a while back. And the one person they said, uh, oddly of all things, was Bob Cousy, um, because he was a lot about the same size as John Stockton, who was a guard um, in Utah, and, uh, and, and kind of did a lot of things that John Stockton did. Uh, but I got to think Bill Russell could play. I mean, I mean, the guy says to me, you know, could Kevin McHale hit a three-pointer, you know? Uh, because everybody has to hit a three-pointer. It's all mobility and... And, and, and he could. It, it, huh? He and did. He learned to shoot them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, Wilt would probably be great at a three-pointer. I don't know. I, it, you really can't bring him from that era to this era. Maybe you can bring him from 86 a little bit. But even so, it's hard, I think. It's, it's a whole different game. Yeah, I bet if you took the Warriors and put them in the 60s, they would have a hard time not not with no flagrant foul rule, for instance. Yeah. And every time Steph Curry would go in the paint and, and get yeah. his nose broken, I don't think he would yeah. like that very much. I don't think they're used to that kind of play. Yeah, no, I mean, Jim Luskatoff was was Draymond Green times two, you know, he, he was a pounder. He, he was punching guys, you know, and uh, uh -huh. it, it was a tough... It was a tough time. You, you know, they had the two referees and maybe they didn't see a whole lot of stuff. I remember talking to the late, great Tommy Heinsohn saying to him just a few years ago, well, the athletes are so much better today. And he said, that's crazy. The athletes were just as good back then. I said, well, but they jumped so much higher. He said, he said, we couldn't jump back then. If you jumped, you would get undercut and you had no idea how you were going to land and the referees wouldn't protect you. So yeah. there was no high flying back then because you might get killed doing that. Yeah. And that, that made a lot of sense to me. And then there, there was no weight training. There was no, none of this stuff that goes on now, you know? Um, there was smoking yeah. though. There was smoking. smoking. Yeah. But Mal Graham, who I talked to, who was on that team in 69, you know, I, I said, well, how, how, I said that question kind of, how would they do? And he said, um, we were men when we played back then, everybody was a man. He said, everybody went to four years of college, was coached by great college coaches, came into the NBA. And the NBA, they say how there were fewer teams, you know, you had to be pretty good to make the NBA. You yeah. know, whereas now they bring kids out of high school, out of their first year of college, and they still have to learn a, a bit about playing basketball. Um, and so that's a valid point. To, um, in the favor of the, the 60s guys, uh, no but doubt. It, it, it's a whole different situation. And talk a bit about this. Let's talk a bit about the smoking. John Havlicek told me the first time he went to the locker room, he had to, he had to do the <coughs> at halftime of the Celtics playoff game because all the players were in there smoking. They were, they were. Um, but Buddy LaRue, who later was an owner of the Red Sox, he was the trainer of the, the, the Celtics. I guess he did great work in, in trying to discourage, discourage guys from smoking. And Bill Russell used to smoke. I think they all used to smoke, except for Havlicek, who, who yeah. was kind of pure of mind and body. Um, but Buddy LaRue kind of kind of pushed them all, and, and, and they mostly gave him up, except for Tom Heitzen. Um, Tom Heitzen went to the, the hypnotist in Brookline to, to give up smoking. And he came back and, and he told me all about it. And he had given them up for, for a couple of weeks. And I went to the same hypnotist. I said, give me the guy's number. And I, I went and, uh, and I, I gave up smoking for two weeks because I was embarrassed at spending the money for the hypnotist. And then I started smoking again. 
I remember seeing your keyboard years ago of, you know, an old Macintosh and the the scars of ashes on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, oh, well, I mean, you had this rhythm, right? You would, you'd yeah. like take a puff, put it down, type three sentences. Yeah, puff. now we're talking. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> I hope I, I hope you don't have a really relapse. It's yeah. been a while since you smoked. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was quite a time. It's, it's great talking to you about it. I have to say it. I really, it's really true. I've been waiting years for you to write a book like this, and um, I really am glad you did it before you're dead. Yeah, I'm glad I did it before I was dead too. You know? Yeah, I mean, but, but, you know what? What about, really, the, what about the sequel? But you know what would be really story, really good story if you did it after you were dead. No, yeah, yeah. that would be something. Thank so you. We Ian. have just a few minutes to get a couple audience questions in here. Are Ian, did you have any final points you wanted to end on before we leap into audience questions? No, just to reiterate, it's just a terrific book. And yeah. here I am. I've been covering. I, covered the NBA full time for Sports Illustrated for 15 years. And I learned so much from reading this. And, and I, I was really hungry to learn what was in this book. And then also to, uh, to learn all these stories from one of my best friends. And I didn't know these stories either. And you would think I would know them all the time I've spent with Lee and all the late night talks. I mean, maybe I've forgotten some of them because they were so late and because of what we were doing while we were talking, but. It's the beauty of Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Book. But anyway, it's just a it's a beautiful book. It's, Thank it's you so beautiful. much. Thank you for doing this too. You know, thank, thank you make me sound smarter than I am. <laughs> yeah. So uh Tall Men Short Shorts is available from Gibson's bookstore and signed book plates are included with your purchase from Gibson's. Uh Lee, let's leap into audience questions here. Dan asks, he says, there are so many fantastic stories in the book. Did Wilt have a fatal flaw in your opinion? And if he did, what was it? Yeah, I, I think the, his, Wilt's fatal flaw was that he, he didn't organize his thoughts right. He, he didn't, he never contributed to the kind of the team thing. You know, he, he, he was a coach killer and, and he, he was really the first, I don't know, superstar superstar you know with, with all the trappings and kind of he, he was so gifted that he never really had to work at what he was doing i mean that was that's my thought okay uh, janine wants to know um which of your books has been your favorite to write and dan on that note wants to know was there a moment when you decided to transition from newspapers and magazines to writing books yeah um Let's see, um, what was the first question? Um, which of your books has been your favorite to write? You, you know, they've, they've all kind of been fun. I, I did a book on Ted Williams and, and he, he, was, um, he was my boyhood idol. Um, and, and so I wound up talking to a lot of guys um, who, who were from that era when I collected baseball cards and, and, and I kind of knew him. So that was a lot of fun. But this book probably was the most fun of all and, and you know, kind of sneaking my little stories in. Um, what was the second question? Um, when did you decide to transition from newspapers and magazines to books? Um, it, 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 it's funny, I was, I was a newspaper guy and I, I, I did that for, for 21 years. And I had a little bit of a feeling like, like I'd become old Bob in the corner, you know? I mean, you get that sometimes and, you, and they, they say, well, we got old Bob. And then I got a chance to go to Sports Illustrated and to write magazines, which were, you know, I was writing maybe 800 to 1,000 words in, in the newspaper, but it was all, the newspaper was all immediate, um, whereas Sports Illustrated was a chance to, to write longer stories and to go to people's houses and to kind of get to know inside them. And so I, I went for that. And then uh, I, I wrote a couple of books. I wrote a book on Dale Earnhardt um, after he passed away. And, and that was a big seller. And so I, I, I had acquired an agent and I said to my agent, well, Esther, you know, could I do this again? And Esther said, oh, you can do better than this, you know? And so I said, 
I'm going to quit Sports Illustrated. I'm just going to write books. And I, I, I went to writing books and Esther might have been lying, you know, that uh, Dale Earnhardt was the big, the big book until now, tall men, short shorts. And, uh, and so it, it's a different process doing a book. It, it, it's all just expanding on, on your knowledge, I think. All right. Um, Patrick asks, Lee, could you give a little insight on the pivotal game four of the 1969 finals? They were close to 50 turnovers and the final shot was a buzzer beater play called the Ohio. Yeah, it, it, it was a terrible game, you know, and, and this was the most important game in the whole series because the Celtics for the first time in their history had lost the first two games on the road and they had come back really needing to win one of the two games in, in Boston to make it a series. And they won the first one by, because they were running, as they said, we wanted to run. And then the next game, everybody was really beat. You know, they, they'd flown from the coast to coast and the time, the time difference had, had kind of beat up everybody. And the game was just sloppy, 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 but very close at the end. And it, it all came down. To, there were a bunch of different things that happened, but it came down to that the, the Celtics had a play with like seven or eight seconds left and they were down by a point. And they, they, they brought out a play that the Celtics had like six plays that they ran and everybody knew what they were, but they, they had this little secret play that they had worked out. It was, it was from, from Ohio State where John Havlicek and Larry Siegfried had played and it, it they, they said, let's run the Ohio State play. And it had no name. They call it the Ohio, but it had no name. And it was the exact same play that, that is in the movie Hoosiers, um, where, where, um, where, where they, they, they run the thing they call the picket fence. And it's three guys setting picks. And Sam Jones, in this case, came around. And John Havlicek threw the ball to Sam Jones, who was the best shooter on the team. And Sam slipped as he came around behind the three picks. And he said, I got to throw the ball up and maybe Bill Russell can get the rebound if it's a terrible shot. And he threw the ball up off his long foot and he just went up and it hit the rim and it bounced high and it came back down and came through the basket and the Celtics won by a point. And Bill Russell wasn't even in the game. He had taken himself out of the game because he was, he was afraid that, that, um, that, that, that Los Angeles would have fouled him and made him throw foul shots and he wasn't the greatest. It, it was a terrific win and it was, it was half lucky and half skill. And that's what made the whole series the series because now it became the best two out of three instead of the best of seven. The Lakers have been, been favored by two to one to win the whole thing. Uh, Kevin wants to know, is there a player today that plays like Bill Russell? I don't know. Um, there's, there, there's players that, that look a little bit that, that are kind of defensive minded, you know. Um, this young guy at Phoenix kind of has that look. Uh, but but nobody, I, nobody comes right to my mind. Ian, does somebody come to your mind? Sorry, I was muting. Um, you know that Robert yeah. Williams, the young guy for the Celtics, he has he has a little bit of that defensive kind of slap things away situation. Well, but, but nobody, I think, is as, as cerebral as Russell was. It was a funny thing years ago. Tom Heinsohn got caught up doing a game and said, Greg Steamsma reminds me of Bill Russell. Do you remember that? Yeah. But the one, the one I always thought was that Celtics team with Garnett. Garnett was the closest thing to me to Russell as far as just the temperament he had, the fact that he – they had to talk Kevin Garnett into scoring with the Celtics. They used to beg him to shoot. They could run the they could run their offense through Kevin Garnett because he loved to pass like Russell did. And Garnett changed them from, you know, a do-nothing team into a defensive-minded team. I'm not saying he's anything close to Bill Russell, but as far as the influence he had on the Celtics, he he transformed them. And I always thought it was interesting with that team. Rondo was a little bit of a modern day koozie with all the flair and Paul Pierce, uh, you know, uh, is a bit of Sam Jones and Ray Allen ran crazy all the time, like Havlicek. 
there was like a lot of resonance with that team when you look at the old Celtics teams, that 2008 championship Celtics team. That's what I think too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with you. That's very good. All right, last question here from Patrick again. Watching those final final games closely, what are your thoughts of Jerry West winning the finals MVP, the only award winner from a losing team? Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing thing that, that, that he, he was he, he was the only award. He, he clearly he clearly was was the star of that whole series in, in the, uh, if you were, if you're going to put a spotlight on someone, he was the star. Whether he was the MVP or not, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the final game was in Los Angeles at the Forum, and the votes were taken from the, the sports writers in the Forum. And there, there were three sports writers from Boston, and, you know, maybe some, a few from her. They idolized Jerry West. He he was he he was uh, Sir Galahad, you know, fighting everything. Okay, thank you so much to the two of you for joining us this evening. Ian Thompson, the author of The Soul of Basketball, and Lee Montville, author of the new book, Tall Men, Short Shorts. Thank you so much for the two of you for coming to Gibson's Bookstore virtually to discuss this uh, topic with us tonight. Um, any final thoughts to, to end on the, the current season of basketball for our uh, audience members? I would just go, I'll, I'll let you have the last, I'll let you have the last word. I would just say, it's amazing when I look back on those teams that you wrote about Lee and that era, they would almost always play 82 games, those guys. And you look at what's going on in the NBA today, everybody gets hurt all the time. And they've got all of these, uh, state of the art conditioning that they do. They've got much better sneakers than the, than the Chuck Taylors those guys had. But those guys in a much more physical era would play all every game of the season. And it's just amazing to me. Yeah. No, I mean, Will, um, Bill Russell and, and, uh, and John Havlicek played every minute of every game. Will played, played every minute of every game till. Till the curious time when he left in the seventh game. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a different time. It's a different. Who would who will win this thing? I don't know. It's very strange. It seems very home court home court oriented. Um, and Milwaukee certainly, you know, came faced up to the challenge to make it a best two out of three. And as we've seen, two out of three it could go any way. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for the two of you for joining us this evening. And thank you to our audience members at home. That's it for us tonight. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.